This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. In about 90 minutes, President Obama will deliver the most anticipated State of the Union message in nearly a decade. Not since George Bush's address after the 9-11 attacks has there been such intense curiosity about what a president will say, maybe even more. This time, the cataclysm was political. The shocking loss of Ted Kennedy's Senate seat to Republican Scott Brown in Massachusetts last week, which in turn killed, at least for now, the historic health reform bill that Congress was oh so close to passing. With our analysts and with your help, we will preview the speech and explore our hopes for it. What do you think is the most important thing the president should say tonight? Our phone number is on your screen. While you're dialing, Watch this reminder of the specter hanging over tonight's address. This video is called The Year in Obama-Led Health Reform, produced by the liberal website Talking Points Memo. Our time of standing... Our time of standing pat and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. There is work to be done. Raise health care's quality and lower its costs. All this we can do. All this we will do. There are some who question the scale of our ambitions, who suggest that our system cannot tolerate too many big plans. Their memories are short. They have forgotten what this country has already done. A clear consensus that the need for health care reform uh, is here and now. This isn't a Harry and Louise moment. It's a Thelma and Louise moment. We've got to get this done. We've got to get it done this year. We've got to get it done this year, both in the House and in the Senate. And we don't have any excuses. Uh, the stars are aligned. The time is now. Fixing what's wrong with our health care system is no longer a luxury we hope to achieve. It's a necessity we cannot postpone any longer. It's time to deliver. We are going to fix it when we pass health insurance reform this year. When we pass health insurance reform, when we pass health insurance reform this year. We are going to get this done this year. The debate's been good. But every debate at some point comes to an end. At some point, it's time to act. I'm confident we are going to get health reform passed this year. We're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. We are going to pass health care reform by the end of this year. We're going to get health care done this year. I don't quit. We get this stuff done. We keep on going. Until we get it done. We're going to get this done. We're going to fight for it. We are on the precipice of an achievement that's eluded Congresses and Presidents for generations. I am absolutely confident this is going to pass. You made that speech in August. Well, one of the things that I've learned in Washington is you have to repeat yourself a lot. Let's see how he repeats himself or adds to that video tonight. The State of the Union message is the big news of the day, and we will devote our first half hour to it. So do call in. Our number is on the screen, 212-251-0801. Again, the question, what is the single most important thing that you think the president should say tonight? Later, we'll move on to the big news in the world of high tech. Apple's new tablet computer was rolled out today. Will the iPad, as hyped and hoped, give books, magazines, even newspapers a new life. Here's a short peek at the iPad in a promotional video from Apple. If you want to focus on a single message, just rotate to portrait and everything else gets out of the way so you can concentrate on the content you care about. Much more iPad later. First, tonight's State of the Union message. We already know the president will propose a three-year spending freeze on many domestic programs, and he's forming a commission to decide the best way to fix the deficit. But what will he say about jobs, the banks, health care, security? How can we, he regain some lost political capital? Joining us, veteran Democratic political consultant Hank Scheinkopf, Nancy Scholar, from Tech President, which monitors the web's coverage of politics, and via Skype, Ben Smith from the online journal Politico. Welcome to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us, sir. And Hank, as a political consultant to Democrats, I will ask you the same question that we're asking our viewers. Sure. What's the single most important thing that the president can say tonight? Uh, 
The most important thing he'd say is, I'm going to get America working again. He's got to get this onto something that is much more positive, doable, and something that people really care about. You know, people without food in their bellies are much more likely to be angry. It's a lot of people out of work. That's the issue of the moment, and that's kind of what's been lost in the last year. And the question is, how? What can he say in a speech that will tell America that the government is actually going to help them get back to work? And Ben, I understand that uh, you've been past some talking points that the president's allies are supposed to be talking up tonight. What are they going to tell us? Well, uh, you know, I mean, the speech is both looking back and looking forward. They are, they are beginning in part by saying, remember where we were a year ago, Bush ruined everything, we're rebuilding from that, there's going to be a real kind of focus on rebuilding and attempt to remind the country that this is not all Barack Obama's fault. Um, and, and in fact, a Democrat just, just a little nervous about this theme sent over a, a Ronald Reagan's 1982 State of the Union, which he also blames everything on Jimmy Carter. So it's, it's you know, that's, that's, that's part of the theme. And then, you know, there's a mixture of, of, of Touting the touting the accomplishments like the stimulus, like legislation that passed very early on, and trying to feel people's pain, and then also throwing out little kind of Clinton-style mini initiatives like earmark reform, which will warm John McCain's heart probably. But like a lot of State of the Unions, it's sort of the genre. It's a laundry list. It's not a you know it's not stirring oration we're talking about. So let, let me read your body language a little here, Hank. During <laughs> sure. Ben's answer, you were nodding when he said Clinton-style mini-reforms. You were shaking your head when he said Reagan-style Carter bashing. You don't want to hear Bush bashing tonight? We're missing the point. People didn't, they weren't upset about centrist government necessarily, or even conservatives. They were upset about George Bush. And the decision they made was to change that. You know what they have now is a, is a melange of things that's just not clear. So they're suffering. The public is, has a tremendous amount of information. is suffering from a lack of clarity and needs a leader who's going to say who's going to make some clear clarity tonight. If they don't get that, they're going to be angry tomorrow because they're they're hurting. They wanted to see change. They didn't get what they wanted. It's kind of like ordering from a menu where you don't get what you want. You say you want fish. The guy brings pasta. You don't want pasta. You wanted the fish. You know. Well, they, they probably wanted, you know, cake and to eat it, too. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Touche. Nancy, from your tech president perspective, yeah. the web helped President Obama get elected. For sure. Has it turned on him in his first year? Uh, I think it has turned on him to some extent, sure. I think, you know, when Ben talks about the rehashing of the past, um, in some ways you can look at that and say it's too negative for the American public. But I think what Obama has to, before him tonight is to sort of uh, reset how people talk about his presidency. And I think in some ways that's going to drive the conversation forward more than what's actually in this speech. And I think something that Obama hasn't done very well over his first year is actually have that conversation with the American public of this is where we came from, this is where we're going, which really what is what drove his campaign in a lot of ways. He ca carried people along with him on the journey step by step explaining along the way what's happening, talking to them in an adult manner like he did with the race speech in Philadelphia. And I think he really hasn't done that. He sort of got into the office and said, thanks very much, turn, you know, turn around and turn this, what had been kind of a dialogue into a monologue. So I think people are kind of looking for him to say, you know what, I'm kind of going to reset this relationship with the American public and with the press to some extent. Well, let's see what some of our viewers think. What's the most important thing President Obama can say tonight? Arthur in Brooklyn, you're on the air. Hi, Arthur. Thanks for calling. Hi, Brian. I think the, the major thing that we need to have him do is uh, reset a philosophy in his leadership. He's been seeking bipartisanship that's been enormously ineffective, and he has to stop this. Uh, Mitch McConnell, Senator DeMint, have made it very, very clear that they, they want him to fail. You're never going to have an effective bipartisanship unless... The, the party you're trying to work with wants you to succeed, and the Republicans clearly do not want this. And unless he has to make a change and become a unilateral leader, I'm afraid. Unilateral leader. Don't even try for an unattainable bipartisanship, says Arthur in Brooklyn. Other viewers, what do you think is the most important single thing that President Obama should say tonight? We're here live. Give us a call. Um, Hank Shankoff, how, how does that look? I mean, the, he was elected with this bizarre coalition mm -hmm. of net roots populists mm -hmm. on the left sure. and centrist independents. Oh. 
Can that coalition possibly be held together? Very hard to do. But I want to go back to something Nancy said, which I think bears bears getting back to the the web can be used to keep this discussion going, and if it does, Nancy's right, some good can come from it for the president. I mean, that's the place where you go for real democracy, I guess, from from people who are involved in web web conversations. Can he keep this coalition together? Well, take the web out of the question for a second. Can he keep it together? Very, very tough for a whole host of reasons. Because he really does want to please everybody. Because he does want to bring everybody along. And he's not brought along most of his own party. And he's not going to bring the Republicans along. This is a Harry Truman moment. Why? Barack Obama has uncorked the bottle of populism. And what's come out is populism. But he hasn't been the populist leader. That is the problem. And he's not going to win it within his own party, who are scared to death of losing. It means they have to take a stand, and he's not going to win the Republicans over. So it's him versus them. So, Ben Smith, same question pretty much. Does he have to choose between the Netroots populists and the centrist independents who liked him because he seemed postpartisan in the campaign? I mean, you know, th that was a choice he had always made, which was to appeal to the centrist, to the swing voters, to the middle. And that's who he's trying to keep, you know, who's trying to appeal credits kind of been reading the polls in the last couple of months and have decided that, that anger is the new hope you know that that for all the kind of we now we instead of identifying with people's hopes he's trying to explain to people that he understands and channels and will express their anger and particularly at you know finance executives in any way he can um and the, the problem with a lot of this stuff is that it feels contrived that it's very straightforwardly political that it's right out of you know the bill clinton playbook and somewhere Hank's old friend Dick Morris is smiling, and you know Obama ran very explicitly at some point, kind of ridiculously against this stuff. The idea that C-SPAN was going to be in negotiations was always kind of ridiculous. And then when it, when some of those things don't play out, it becomes a problem for him. Let's take another call, Ellen, in Manhattan. Ellen, thanks for calling. Hi, you're welcome. Um, I don't know if this is politic for him to mention, but I know that I would like to hear him address the gargantuan power of corporations, which since the uh, last week's um, Supreme Court decision, the whole AIG and uh, Goldman Sachs power plays, it seems to me that this is a huge issue, and I'd like to know if your experts think it would be impolitic of him to go after corporate power. Thank you very much. Ben, first of all, do you think that we are going to hear something like that tonight? Yes. Yeah. Gonna, this is an excuse to go after foreigners, in fact, a favored target of populists. Foreigners? Yes, because the the, corp, the ruling which allows corporations to spend freely in elections allows, you know, corporations controlled by foreign shareholders also to spend freely in elections. And the White House is, is in the process of rolling out a legislative package which they aiming to prevent that. Um, but, Hank, again, to this anger that Ben was talking about mm -hmm. and that the president wants to tap into tonight. My sense is that different groups of people are angry at different parties. So the populists on the left and a lot of poor people in America are really angry at the corporations. They feel they were responsible for mm -hmm. bringing down the economy, for making their homes unaffordable, especially the Wall Street right. banks. Um, the centrist independents, the Tea Partiers on the right, the people who helped get Scott Brown elected in Massachusetts, sure. they're not angry at those people. They are angry at the president and the Democratic mm -hmm. Congress for forced, foisting big government on them. Is that no, correct? That, that's part of it. What's happened is the anger at the corporations has now gone to from Wall Street to Washington because they expect Washington to do something to tame Wall Street. And the fact is that Washington will do very little to tame Wall Street. Why? Because those people are rational in the Congress. They want to be reelected. Where does their money come from? Big corporations, big power blocks. And the, ju the, the, the joke here is that the average person gets more information than not and knows that's the truth. So Barack Obama has got to be Harry Truman. And if he's not Harry Truman, he's going to have a heck of a time come November. So, Nancy, how does the web change the backdrop for this speech? Hank just said the people have more information than ever. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true of people who use the Internet actively for information. How for sure. is the 2008... St 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 how was the 2008, how was the 2006 yeah. State of the Union Address different from the 2010 State of the Union Address in those terms? Yeah, it was interesting. There was actually an article in The New Yorker last week that talked about this this uh, relationship between Obama and the media. And the writer, was Ken Aletta, I believe, referenced uh, how after uh, John Kennedy gave the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
Cuban Missile Crisis speech, they actually cut right back to regular programming. <laughs> and, you know, it's a very different world than uh, Barack Obama. Now back to the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> exactly. And Barack Obama will probably get, you know, maybe two seconds of applause before they cut to sort of the cable uh, talking heads. So it's a very different world for sure. I think, you know, what has been disheartening to a lot of people is that the Obama campaign was so skilled at navigating this new world. They really sort of got the rhythms and the metabolism of, this, of the news cycle, the information cycle, the way people expected to get, to get information. And it seems like they really lost that when they came into the into the White House. But I think you know one of the things that I think is promising for some people who are interested in seeing uh, Obama kind of recapture that momentum is something that sounds somewhat gimmicky, but uh, might have a lot of potential. And that's that they're rolling out a YouTube program during tonight's State of the Union address, where people can submit questions, either text or video questions, through YouTube. And then there's going to be a, a week of voting online, the sort of you know popu online populism, let people vote. The ones that bubble up to the top. Uh, some of them Obama's going to address next week. It's smart in a lot of ways because it resets this conversation. It, it kind of, you know, reclaims this mantle of somebody who's been willing to have a dialogue with the people. And I think it's potentially pretty savvy on the part of the White House because it extends the moment of actually concentrating on the substance of the speech. The last time he did that, the question that bubbled up to the top was legalization of marijuana. <laughs> That's what, you know, there, that is why there's a little bit of a filter put in now. Um, you know, and it's a question of, frankly, he didn't, you know, I think you could say he didn't handle that question overly well. He sort of, you know, punted on it and made fun of the questioner. And the, but, you know, that goes to show that this is a process. You learn how to deal uh, with some of these new mediums. And by the White House really stopping one month into the presidency um, after that forum, they really didn't, haven't given themselves the opportunity to learn how to be president in this age. So, Stewart in Brooklyn, what's the most important single thing the president can say tonight? Stuart, are you there? Yes, hi, Brian. Good night. How are you? Go ahead. Hi. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm very hurt and disappointed by the performance of Barack Obama. Uh, America reminds me of an 18-wheel trailer going down I-95 that has been assembled with faulty bolts on its wheels. And every so far it, it goes down on the highway, it loses the wheel. We are seeing the economic system falling apart. We are seeing, as people, ordinary citizens, we cannot get any health care. We are also seeing the, the extreme amount of corruption by government officials. We are seeing a war that has taken $12 billion a month from the American taxpayers. There is no country in the history of mankind, no power in the history of mankind, with its expansionism going on and on and on, does not end up ruining that empire. And this is what is happening to America today. So, Stuart, is there, one is, thing, is there one thing that you could put at the top of your list for the president to say tonight that would begin to address those concerns? Yes. Why is he not standing up to try to stop the ruin of this empire by this expansionism, these types of wars that has taken so much out of the taxpayers of America. Stuart, thank you very much for your call. And Ben Smith, are we going to hear about the war tonight? Are we going to hear the word terrorism? Are we going to hear the word Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, we are. And he's going to, you know, defend. I mean, and, oddly enough, those have turned out to be his more popular policies. He is better liked and better respected on foreign policy than on domestic policy. He's going to At talk about At least by that. Republicans. <clears throat> I, that's, and I think by Democrats, though I, I'm not sure about the polling. But that's, um, that's not going to be the heart of the speech. I mean, just to, to, to the caller, he did, he basically campaigned on escalating the war in Afghanistan. So while people on the left are unhappy mm -hmm. about it, there was kind of a willful, I mean, ignorance on the left during part of the campaign that he would really go and do this. I think people on the right believe that he was this stealth kind of socialist lefty. And some people on the left also believe that he was this stealth lefty and was not really going to send more soldiers to Afghanistan. And, you know, he did. And he did. Uh, so, Hank, on health care, does the president sweep it under the rug tonight? Does he fight for it and say, this is not 1994, 1995. We are going for this thing and we're going to get it in some form or another with or without Scott Brown. What does he do? He ought to say the battle goes on to do what's right for Americans, getting them back to work and giving them health care that's affordable. 
and it might even define what the health care bill is because half the country still doesn't know what it is and yeah. that is and more than that and that is what is driving them nuts they want to know what this is you know People, previous survey research that I was involved in or had access to always said that when you talked about the economy or anything having to do with dough, money, you had to be very careful because people viewed these things like a clock that had a kind of imprecision, and if the imprecision got too big, it would all blow up. Nothing's changed. This is an economic argument. Make it understandable. They have failed at communicating, and that's where web use and other devices ought to come in. The job of the newspapers um, and people like Ben, who terrific journalists, is not to explain the president. The job of them is to explain the president to people. The president's job is to explain the president. It's a very different ben, dynamic. Ben, you are, you disagree with at least some of that, don't you? Uh, um, with that, uh, what, what do I disagree with? Ben? Well, I, I, that he's a good journalist. Uh, very good. Yeah, that he's so very I, very no, good. I, I don't. He's not gonna. He's not gonna. Sorry, he's not gonna elaborate. I mean, according to the, they just they just while we were on here, it circulated some advanced excerpts. I, which because I'm staring at my screen, I, I took a look at when he says that we're not going to walk away from health care. But it's not the. It does not look like it's the heart of the speech. He mentions, you know, we're going to prevent insurance companies from discriminating against people. But it's 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 not the core of the speech, and he's not trying to resell it. He's also not doing what a lot of people, a lot of progressives, particularly in the House, hope or said. And I want Congress to come out of here and ram it through tomorrow. He's certainly not doing that. What else have you got there that's new? You have some new information about uh, what he's going to say in those excerpts? Um, you just, you know, the he. He's, he is still hopeful. The State of the Union, you will be surprised to learn, is strong, um, despite all of the challenges. And, there, and, and then there's and then there's a long passage on, on earmark reform, and it's it's actually sad. John McCain always used to say, you know, you will know their names, referring to the members of Congress who had earmarks. And he's calling on Congress to assemble some kind of database of earmarks so that you can know who supplied which earmark where. This is stuff that during the that last year Obama basically derided. As kind of small ball, as you know, typical politics. You know, earmarks for all that they're easy to make fun of are a tiny, tiny portion of the budget. Let's keep our eye on the main thing. And this is kind of an evolution toward a more, you know, more normal politics. Essentially. Nancy, here's an indication of how much the president has lost the web. Remember Obama Girl, mm -hmm. the Obama Crush video, one of the most viewed videos I think in YouTube history. Mm -hmm. She came out today and graded the president a B minus on his first <laughs> year. And I don't know if you have a crush on people who you grade B minus, uh, but said he has to do more to deal with jobs. This is Obama girl. How, yeah. did, how, did, how did this president, this candidate, lose the web? Did they not really believe in it in the first place? Well, I think it's important to parse that, right? I mean, I think that the... Um the the presence of Obama girl and the popularity of Obama girl goes to point to the fact that the web's not all good, <laughs> you know, um, that she gained sort of such a prominence during the OA campaign. Um, but I think it's important. You talked before about the idea that he's lost the net roots, right? Uh, Barack Obama never really had the net roots per se. When he was running for president, he wasn't the darling of the left, the the sort of online left, and he really built a coalition out of centrists and out of turning out new voters. Wait, he wasn't? Weren't they a big part of that new voter? block that turned out? I mean, I think if you look at sort of the, the what you think of sort of uh, big name progressive bloggers, no. I mean, there was a, a very spirited debate over whether or not Post he was sort of Josh a, Marshall and people like that. They were very late to the to the to the uh, to the train, you know, when it when it appeared to be he was, you know, he was going to be the nominee. That's when they yeah. sort of got on board. Right. So I think, you know, I, it's not at all unexpected that they would be disheartened with him because they never really, you know, were heartened with him. And, <laughs> and if people want to take part in this post speech interactivity, they just go to you. YouTube? Yes, and it's not clear if it's actually open up at nine, or you have to actually wait until until you hear the speech yeah, before the speech. you can comment. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. We'll have to wait and see and hear for ourselves. And after this preview of the State of the Union message coming up at nine p.m. tonight, I invite you to join me at nine o'clock for a live online chat during the speech. Go to wnyc.org when the speech begins, and we will have an online chat with you and many listeners and viewers. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. And now, here are this week's online video picks. Number one, ingenuity meets disaster. This is a Doctors Without Borders video about the kind of MASH-like mobile hospital they are erecting in Haiti.
Doctors Without Borders, Doctors Without Buildings, Heroes for Our Time. They put up eight of those hospital tents in one night. Video pick number two shows the destruction in Haiti in a unique way. It's an interactive aerial view of Port-au-Prince before and after the quake, produced by the New York Times. Let's look at one spot in the capital as an example. This is a golf course as it looked before the quake. You can see that after the quake, it has become a refugee camp. You can see other before and after images as seen from space at nytimes.com. Video pick number three, 2009 may not have been such a good year for the country in many ways, but it was in at least one respect. According to this video from the Sunlight Foundation, it was a very good year for government transparency. I couldn't quite get the attention before of political reporters because they thought, oh, you're too much about technology. And the tech writers are like, oh, you're too political. But that all changed in 2009. And we've seen the changes from the stimulus, which had very little time, that it was online, to cap and trade, which had some. Um, but then the amendments were not online. And now, actually even more than we've asked for with the health care bill, seeing that change throughout the entirety of 2009, where it's actually now almost an assumption uh, based on the, the kind of the uprising of citizens saying we demand that Congress reads the legislation that they're going to pass to impact our lives and that we are going to have access to that so we can make our voice heard about what we care about. Um, and that's just a really huge fundamental shift. When leadership in the House and the Senate decided that they were going to start posting all earmark requests online, um, that took us a little bit by surprise. That's something that we had been asking for for, uh, for a long time in a lot of different contexts. Um, and usually we brought it up as something that we didn't expect to happen. And we went very quickly from that being something that was uncomfortable but was worth bringing up to something that leadership was backing and was going to be required of every member of Congress. To its credit, the Obama administration continues to gradually put more government data online on new platforms. It's now up to journalists and other private citizens to find ways to make the data relatable to a larger public so it can be used for the greater good. Video pick number four is a commentary on the Supreme Court decision allowing unlimited spending by corporations and other groups during political campaigns. It's from a guru of free access to creative content online, UC Berkeley professor Lawrence Lessig. This, of course, is an extraordinarily important decision. It's the proverbial fuel on the fire. But many people will see this decision as a decision they should fight because they think corporations should be silenced. I don't think the point here is that corporations should be silenced. I think the point is we need a political system where people can trust that the decisions Congress makes are decisions based on the merits, on what makes sense or what the people in their district want and not what the funders demand. This decision will only exacerbate the current problems with the system. And the way we should respond is by pushing for an alternative that gets us a system for funding elections that doesn't lead people to wonder whether it's money rather than sense that is producing a political result. Now, there is a statute that's already been introduced as a bill in Congress that would achieve just this, the Fair Elections Now Act. This would establish citizen-funded elections, where candidates can receive up to $100 from any citizen and also money provided from the state whenever they establish certain credibility in a campaign. If we had that alternative, even if corporations were participating in the political speech market by saying whatever they wanted to say, people could believe that it was the merits of the decision and not the money that was driving the result. This is an extraordinarily important moment. And we need to organize to push as strongly as we can to get an alternative to the current system for funding elections that at least makes it possible for people to trust government again. Lawrence Lessing, who made that video, is also a founder of ChangeCongress.org, which backs citizen-funded elections. And video pick number five, do you play Farmville, the most popular game on Facebook? Who would have thought that people in our rough and tumble world would get so into a game where the main object is to grow vegetables and raise animals? Video maker Tabuscus 
just can't take it. Are you tired of games that are fun? <laughs> yes. Me too. Fun sucks. Stand aside, action and excitement. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Farm Bill. From milking cows to putting chickens in coops, this game pushes the limits of the imagination backwards. Here's a taste of the action. Farm Bill! It's about damn time. It's just like being a real farmer, only without the benefits. Farm Bill! Play Farm Bill to get out of dealing with issues, spending time with your children, or farming. Farm Bill! Where did the time go? Farm Bill! Designed by Kronos himself to alleviate the burden of time. Farm Bill! Okay, back to Grand Theft Auto with you. I have virtual sheep to tend to. And those are this week's online video picks. This is Brian Lear Live, where web video meets the issues. We've still got an hour or so until the State of the Union address, but one speech of major importance has already happened today. I am referring, of course, to Apple CEO Steve Jobs' announcement of the iPad, the eagerly anticipated tablet computer from Apple. Let's take a look at just a portion of the promotional Apple, uh, the promotional video that Apple released today. We looked at the device and we decided, let's redesign it all. Let's redesign, reimagine, and rebuild every single app from the ground up, specifically for the iPad. And with this large a display, you get apps that aren't just a little bit better than their smaller counterparts. You get apps that are an order of magnitude more powerful. The iPad is the best way to browse the web for the same reasons that it just feels right to hold a book or a magazine or a newspaper in your hands as you read them. It just feels right to hold the internet in your hands as you surf it. And with a screen this large, you can just see more of the web as you're surfing it. Hype, for sure. Cool new platform, almost for sure. But maybe the iPad also has the potential to, forgive me, rekindle the book business. Maybe magazines and newspapers, too. Here to talk about the future of print on paper and screen is Marion Maniker. He writes a blog on the big money called Goodnight Gutenberg. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Is it hype? Uh, well, I'm not sure anything could live up to the hype, but not Apple's hype. It's the expectations of everyone around it that somehow there'd be a magic bullet that would suddenly save print. Uh, so in that sense, it doesn't live up to the hype. It's a, it's a big iPod, um, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, the, the big innovation is apps and being able to have these miniature programs that do thousands of different operations. That's a huge step for print. Uh, you'll see, and we've already seen, good apps for newspapers and magazines. We're going to continue to see better ones and new ways of people engaging in content, both print and video, through those apps. And you also have already seen a similar device shown at CES for the Android operating system. So we'll have, I don't so much think it's a format war, but a, a spreading out, just as you have with PCs and Mac computers, of pushing these ideas across. Shown at CES, CES, the Computer Electronics exactly. Show, just recently. Now, we don't know what its relationship is going to be yet with books. Let's show another piece of the promotional video, which introduces part of the uh, iPad's relationship to books and even a new way to sell books called, what else? The i, uh, called uh, iBooks. <laughs> Another app we're really excited about is called iBooks. When you couple books with a high-res color display, reading an ebook is just such a pleasure. And not only can you read books on it, but the UI actually flips over to reveal a bookstore behind it. And with a tap of your finger, you can purchase and download a book and immediately start reading it. So now we have three phenomenal stores on the iPad. The iTunes Store, the App Store, and now the iBooks Store. So why am I not surprised that along with a new device, they introduced a new store, more than one new store? Exactly, that's the idea. And Steve Jobs stands in the middle of this revenue stream. 
Well, I'm not sure they do. I mean, the thing that happened with uh, iTunes was that they never really made money selling the music. What they did was got the music onto the device and sold more devices. I think something similar is happening here. What they want is just to get the books on the device so people will buy it to read. Uh, when you look at that video, you can see this is something made to look like reading. That's not reading. And I don't think that's the best way to read, something that looks like you're flipping pages. That doesn't make the best use of the device. The Kindle is a bit better at simulating what looking at a printed page is, and that's one of the things not being willing to, to use the Kindle e-ink kind of screen that Apple is trying to do here, say, we'll make it prettier, we'll give you more typefaces. Uh, but I don't think they're going to, to stand in between and try and make money off of the iBook store. They just want to convince people, buy our product because you'll get not just music, but books too. But I understand they have deals already with five publishers, is that correct? Yeah, five of the six. Random House seems to be missing, and Random House being very big is a, is a significant uh, uh, a mission. But these deals mean these publishers are going to do what? They'll provide uh, ebooks, uh, electronic copies of their books uh, to be sold on iBooks. Remember, a lot of books are not available. The books that mostly have uh, been made as ebooks are recently published books, and you know that there's this war going on between when to release the ebook, should it be when the hardcover comes out, is it somewhere between the hardcover and the paperback. But a lot of the books that people want to read, the books that were published 5, 10, 20 years ago, those aren't available, and there hasn't been a huge effort on the publishing houses, which control those copyrights, to put those uh, and make them available on either the Kindle or on this new iBooks. So let me figure out a little bit more, help me figure out a little bit more how this is actually different from the Kindle. It looks to me sure. from these videos that it's kind of a bigger iPod touch or a bigger iPhone yep. without the phone. It's right. about 8 by 10. Uh, it's not a phone, but it is a computer. It'll connect to the internet. It's manipulable. I mean, remember, the great innovation for Apple is this multi-touch screen where you can reach out and, and uh, uh, almost reach into the screen as if it were holding something physical, even though it's not the physical object. The advantage, and that's Apple's advantage, and of course it's the color, it's the design. What Kindle has that they don't is the reflective screen. You can't read that in direct sunlight. You can read the Kindle in direct sunlight. In fact, it works better in brighter light uh, because it doesn't have the, the backlighting to it. It also has better connectivity using the wireless network than, than this will. Uh, this, if you pay the money for the wireless connectivity, we'll have it, but you don't have to pay for anything uh, to get the Kindle's wireless connectivity. So there are a lot of advantages, and I think you will continue to see uh, many people choosing the Kindle over this if that's what they want to get books. This does have that keyboard that comes up. Right? Does the Kindle have something like yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, all I can say is for all of these keyboards is, oi, good luck you, using them. For you, the you, touch keyboards? Yeah, the, the Kindle has a physical keyboard, but it's not the great, greatest key, keyboard. This has a, a, a keyboard like the one on the iPhone, which some people find useful, other people find fr frustrating. But, you know, for reading, the issue isn't isn't the keyboard. You shouldn't be inputting that much into these things. What the, what the world needs is a way for you to feel like you are manipulating the pages. And that's what the multi-touch screen does. You can flick through the pages and have that feeling that you're actually moving physical pa pages, and you can move text around. This also plugs into a dock where you can use a physical keyboard. Exactly. So it's got that flexibility too, which is new. Will it display Magazines, for example, in a different way. Will magazines be able to have oh. more moving videos, more um, uh, physical uh, features, visual features than on a Kindle? Well, what you will see through using the apps is things that are better than magazines ever were because there are already companies who are creating apps from magazines. There's a, a company called Scroll Motion who just did Esquire's um, uh, app and you can flick through a, a photo spread even better than flicking through the pages in the magazine. You can look at text and have it run along the picture. You can use the magazine in the way you really want to use a ma magazine, not in something that's sort of converted to be used digitally. And and in the Kindle, none of that uh, uh, really works in a meaningful way. Um, British writer Ian McEwen has recently signed a deal with Kindle where he will get 50% of the royalties 
and I guess Kindle will get the other 50%. With deals like that, will prominent writers be lured away from traditional publishers? Because 50% is a lot more than a writer typically gets. Uh, you, you have to be careful with that. That's a 50% royalty with Rosetta Books, his publisher. What Rosetta gets from uh, the ki from Amazon uh, is is a number smaller than the uh, actual uh, list price. So what you pay, only some of that goes through to Rosetta, and of what Rosetta gets, 50% percent goes to Ian McEwen. Having said that, it's much better than what the standard publishers are offering. Will people publish them? No, not immediately. Not Certainly not Ian McEwen, because Ian McEwen publishes a book and it is a huge hit. He's a famous writer. Movies have been hit of his books. He's won numerous awards. People are waiting for his next novel. The people who will be encouraged to uh, will go after these better deals, and Kindle, uh, Amazon has offered a, now a 70% uh, royalty to, to self-publishing authors, are going to be the people who are looking to break in. And this is the publishing industry's big problem. It's not the, the huge bestsellers that are killing them. It's all the books they publish that don't really sell very well, that they spend a lot of money on. That's the thing that's dragging it down. All right. Now stay with us, sure. because we're going to see some real writers in their home in just a minute because coming up next stacked up TV a website rich with videos that spreads love for reading this is Brian Lehrer live ma guess what I went back to college no I didn't quit my job I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life ma you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality Bachelor of Science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime. Yes, Mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business. worried about H1N1? You know, swine flu. Well, CUNY says protect yourself from hidden horrors. Here's how. After touching public surfaces, don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. <laughs> flu is also spread when infected people cough at you. Sneeze into a tissue, never your bare hands, or use your elbow. <laughs> Wash often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand cleanser. There are two kinds of flu shots this season. Consult your doctor or health care provider on the regular and H1N1 vaccinations. Most importantly, if you feel sick and have fever, stay home. Yes, a little caution goes a long way. For more information, visit our website, cuny.edu, and click on H1N1 Update. This is Brian Lair Live, where web video meets the issues. On this day when Apple Computer has debuted its iPad, blogger Marion Manneker remains at our table. He writes, good night, Gutenberg, on the Big Money site. And joining us now is Jill Bowerly. She is a multimedia journalist who has done something unique. She has parlayed her love of the printed word into a visual tribute to writers, and that includes showing us what's on their real wooden bookshelves in their actual homes. Her website, Stacked Up TV, is her love letter to the old-fashioned book. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. And we'll show some of your video excerpts in just a minute with writers and their books. Where did this idea come from? What's the point? Well, the idea started, I was with a couple of um, my friends who ended up being producers on the show, and we were just talking about how, um, how funny it was when our friend talked about her parents' bookshelves, and her parents are psychiatrists, and a lot of the titles of the books are very funny. Um, and we had this idea that we would just go to her parents' house and do this one-off video for YouTube. But then we had sort of a light bulb moment where we said, wouldn't it be great to actually talk to writers about what's on their books, and wouldn't that be a great way to get to know them? So we went ahead and started the website. All right. So uh, let's take a look at an example here. Um, this is going to be um, Rich Cohen on the perfection of the book and the fickleness of reading on an iPod. Do you want to set this up any further? Uh, we, we try to ask 
everyone we interview if they do read electronic books and Rich just burst out with this um, pay on to the book which we loved. Check it out. I really think a book is perfect. I don't think it would be improved on. I do have an iPod uh, touch and I, ha and I have Kindle on that and I have a whole bunch of books on it. All that does is make me think the book I'm reading I probably could find a better one if I kept looking. And it just goes on and on and on and on and it's just some kind of metaphor for modern life and I do not like it. And one thing I like is when you go on a plane and you have a book and that's it. You've made your choice and you're committed to that book and you're going to read it until it opens up to you because you know it takes a while to get into things. So Mary and Manica from uh Good, I'm sorry, goodbye or good night? Good night, Gutenberg. Good night, Gutenberg. You identify with that? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I think that's the important pr uh, point here is physical books, people have a, a very strong emotional attachment to them, uh, and he makes some excellent points. It, it, you cannot replace uh, all the good things we have with reading, especially that, that social aspect where someone comes into your home and learns a lot about you by looking through your bookshelves, uh, uh, by you know having them turn their, their iPad around and say, look at, look at my bookshelves th this way. It, it's going to be different, um, and it's, we're going to lose a lot. On the other hand, another stacked up TV writer, uh, Susan Orleans, you'll see her here defend the electronic book. In 10 years, very few books will be made out of paper. If I read an electronic book, I don't think that I'm doing some terrible disservice. Someone still wrote it. The fact that it's being transmitted in a different form doesn't really bother me that much. I think anytime you see that people really are excited about books, it's very heartening. It makes you feel like this is a very vital and vibrant form still. So Susan Orlean in her home and in her outdoor Adirondack chairs, where does she live? Um, she lives upstate. Upstate New York. New York. Yes. Uh, so do those two videos kind of speak to each other? They do. Um, what was really interesting, I thought the most interesting thing that Susan said we didn't actually put in the video, but she said, you know, in the Middle Ages people must have freaked out when um, the way, the mode of storytelling switched from oral to written, and now we're going through another change, but that doesn't mean that stories will ever go away, and, and that writing will ever go away. Yeah, and so when you even frame the title, Good Night Gutenberg, mm -hmm. is it to lament something that you think is going to be lost? Sure, I mean, losing scribes is something terrible uh, uh, too. Scribe, but a scribe is a person well, who good, documents things, and whether we document on the web or on parchment, does it matter? Well, we, once we had movable type, we gained many things. That's what Gutenberg gave the wor world. We also lost things, the, the personal annotations, the sense of someone actually knowing all of these things. We'll go through that again. We're already seeing that in the way that you, you're interviewing me as a blogger as opposed to a columnist. I write the same sorts of things, it's just broken up in different ways. We have new and better ways of communicating, but we also lose some of those things. I don't think the book business goes away. Books don't go away. They serve a huge purpose, and people have an attachment to them. We're just going to change some of the things that are in between, and we're going to decide what the threshold is on what becomes a book in a different way. Jill, set up our next video with the writer Amanda Stern, who's going to be a little embarrassed here. Yes, um, and I have to credit Amanda for introducing me to a book I'd never heard of before. Um, but one of our questions uh, is to ask writers what book they're most embarrassed by. And it's very revealing. Well, let's watch. Are you ready? I don't know if you are ready for the embarrassing book. It's embarrassing. I keep it in the hoarding space. All right. Influence. Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. It's almost like something's wrong with them, and I love it. This whole book is their self-consciousness packaged to disguise their self-consciousness. I can't get enough of it. It's like reality TV. Tell me more. What was so embarrassing about that book? I think she was just embarrassed that it wasn't a highfalutin literary book. And the whole idea that we use our bookshelves to sort of show off our minds and our, our learning um, is at work here. How much surprise 
did you experience seeing what was on writers' bookshelves? Well, actually, um, their bookshelves are kind of similar. I've noticed um, even within episodes, we've had people mention or recommend the same books. Um, Philip Roth is a big influence. Um, Lu Lucy Greeley, yeah. Joan Didion, uh, Joseph Mitchell. You know, a lot of people have Those just are grabbed writers, that. Writers. Yes. Um, the uh, graphic novelist Laurie Sandell has an embarrassing book too. This is the hidden book of all hidden books. This is actually like my my biggest darkest secret is the secret, <laughs> which I have totally hidden in this corner. Um, it's funny, a girlfriend of mine who we used to work together at Glamour, she and I heard all this hype about The Secret and we were like, you know, we're just going to go buy it. And we ended up spending an entire afternoon lying on her floor, you know, reading The Secret. And then we're like, let's practice The Secret and see what happens. And two seconds later, I got my contract for Glamour. Huh. So Lori and Amanda both saw their embarrassing book as the embarrassing books to end all embarrassing books. Do you think people, writers and others, have complicated emotional attachments to the books in their collection? Oh, I, I think people, that's why you call them around. I mean, if we were rational, we'd keep all our books in the library and take them out to read them and uh, give them back. I mean, the, the owning books is something that uh, Walter Benjamin talked about it being a disease. And he talked about people thinking that you read every book in the library when, uh, that you owned. In fact, it was the other way around. Your library were all the books you were hoping to read or the ones that you couldn't bear to part with. But there was a huge number of them had nothing to do with what you'd actually read. Uh, and that's what the physical book, uh, or at least libraries, is, is about. It's a manifestation of your mind. Do you think writers' relationships with their book collections are more complicated or different in any way than mere readers' collections, uh, relationships with their books? Certainly. Um, just the way that maybe a race car driver might be more connected to automobiles. Yeah. Um, so like in what ways? Um, you know, I think the books reflect um, maybe certain manifest their, their manifestations of, of um, their own the way that they approach the world. You know, um, we just talked to a writer who sa who keeps his bookshelves incredibly, incredibly neat, and he said it was his way of coping with chaos or trying to keep chaos at bay. And so we see this sort of psychological manifestation of the bookshelf. Um, for the writer. Um, and in terms of just a, a, a writer liking books or having a more intense relationship to them, I think it's just because uh, that is their craft and they're constantly learning and going back to their favorite books. All right, one more video from Stacked Up TV. Let's go alphabetizing with the writer Darren Strauss. I'm a complete slob about everything. And my wife laughs that I alphabetize my bookshelf because it's the only thing I'm anal about. I first alphabetized my library in an apartment that was so disgusting. It was like there was mounds of crap, like pizza boxes and clothes. I'd struggle for hours looking for a book because I just had piles of books. And I would say, where is that, where's that damn Milan Kundera book? And so I finally said, all right, one day I'm just going to do it. And, and so I, I, it was like an AA. It was like I reached bottom. Are you shocked when you meet an author and they're not as fastidious as you thought they might be? Um, not shocked. Um, I try to keep an open mind. Is the whole point here, is the subtext here to get people to stop surfing online as much and stop and read a book? Yes. <laughs> um, in fact, um, one of, in an episode we're about to put online, um, the writer actually tells people, if you want to write, turn off the computer. Um, and the subtext of, of the series is really to remind people that to that books are great and they're those things that are right behind you, you know, as you're surfing the web and maybe it's time to turn off your computer and read a book again. And yet it's on the web. Is that like getting people to drive a Hummer to an anti-global warming protest? <laughs> no, no. I, I defend um, the use of video uh, to promote books. I think it's just a great way of sort of bridging the two. And a last word about Good night, Gutenberg. I, do you share a mission here in trying to get people to slow down and read an actual book? 
Oh, I, I think no one wants people to read more than uh, writers, and being able to reach them in new ways is just a way to extend uh, that relationship. Uh, I, I think what people have said about uh, the Kindle as an experience is they read much more. They have their books with them. Uh, the, the advantage of all this is to be able to bring your library with you, uh, and that's a huge advantage. It also, you lose the, you know, the emotional connection, and we have to balance both of those things, and I don't think you're going to find that um, people are going to give up one or the other. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Finally tonight, the Oscar for Best Wedding Proposal Movie Trailer goes to Jeff and Aaron. Now, more than ever, their families and friends must come together to celebrate the dawn of a new era in their relationship. Ten, ten, ten. You are invited to witness an event. Ten years in the making. From the acclaimed director of Clones and Momentum comes a true story about love family, and friendship, and the two people who found it all, introducing Jeffrey Wong and Aaron Martin. In The Wedding of Jeff and Aaron. Showing in real life at a venue in Los Angeles. The marriage begins October 9th, 2010. Save the date. That was from their website, Jeff and Aaron US. It's so sweet, isn't it? The way people document everything in our lives these days. I can't wait to see the divorce film. And that's it for this week's show. We are here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 or anytime online at brianlaird.tv. And join me one half hour from now for a live online chat during the State of the Union Address. You can join the chat at 9 o'clock on the website wnyc.org. Again, join me one half hour from now for a live online chat during the State of the Union Address. You can join the chat, join the group at 9 o'clock on the website WNYC.org. See you there and right here next week.